So I'm delighted to welcome, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Niall McGarry. <laughs> So welcome back to Limerick City. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> and doing a bit of product placement, a little bit. This is Treaty City. This is the f um, one of our startups that we worked with, and it's the first brewery back in Limerick um, since the 1700s. So uh, I just thought we'd give them a little nod because they launched yesterday. So uh, startups go. So what's the, how does it feel like to be back in Limerick? Yeah, it's great to be back in Limerick. I mean, Limerick was a big part of our, my journey. Uh, very proud to go to LIT for four years, the late 90s and early noughties. Uh, feels like uh, it feels like 90 years ago now. I feel like it was the 1700s really compared to where the world has come. But yeah, it's great to be back in Limerick and made so many really, really good friends for life yeah. from Limerick. Um, and I think, yeah, the city has played a big part. And one of, one of the things I remember when I came to Limerick is like, because, you know, I had kind of, at that time, Limerick obviously had quite a kind of a bad uh, reputation and unfairly in most cases. but when I came to Limerick, I learned about you know, the culture of the city, the way that, you know, I suppose in a lot of cases in Limerick, working class people work together to make their lives and everyone else's life better. And, you know, LIT was at the heart of Limerick City. I wasn't out in the leafy pastures of Castle Troy. You know, I actually went to Limerick and um, learned about, you know, all, all the different things that come with Limerick City as a place. I wasn't into rugby when I came down and then obviously Thoman Park, the old Thoman, yeah. was, is right beside us and stuff like that. So. Yeah, a big part of, of my story and, and, and a city that I'm very proud of. And as I said, most of my, I'd say 15 or 20 best mates, about 10 of them are from Limerick. So. Well, that's good. It's good for us. Yeah, today. yeah. Too, too. <laughs> and actually, so, I mean, you know, when people describe you, you know, your entrepreneur, media mogul, mm -hmm. and I know I've heard you talk a little bit about kind of growing up and some people say, you know, you're born an entrepreneur, it's nature and nurture. I mean, you've... You know, we talked a little bit yesterday about what it was like growing up with Niall and Castlebar, and it wasn't like mum and dad were an entrepreneur, was it? It was you no, mum. Mum was a nurse, and dad worked in what was then Telecom Air and was now Air and uh, fitted phones. So two very basic people. I mean, I grew up. Again, I mentioned class earlier, Limerick, because obviously in the UK, class is such a thing. So you become yeah. so much hyper aware about it. But I grew up. Everyone was the same kind of class in, in Castlebar. Everyone was just fairly common and fairly basic and it was a town having said that that was punching above its weight at the time I think where I got and I think we talked about it about like I, I definitely believe entrepreneurship is kind of in you and I don't know where I got it but I, I think I got it a lot from Castlebar as a town it was in the 90s punching above its weight it had a, I think previously in maybe the 70s and stuff like that I had an international song contest but literally had a small airport and all this kind of stuff so it felt like I, I did actually think I was growing up in a city at that stage you know yeah. and I kind of say when I'm over in Limerick or sorry I'm in London you know and I kind of feel like I have you know I'm obviously from a tiny little place in the west of Ireland then but I keep saying I'm from a large urban area just like you and you know they just they just laugh it off and kind of take the piss out of it really but I genuinely felt that Castle Bar was this great place and yeah. I, there was a strong entrepreneurial culture in the town and that's probably where I got my that kind of interest in business at a very early stage I, I would say from 12 I was interested in business. Actually it's because when we were talking yesterday like I was 14 when I had my first job and now like young you know young people they you know I suppose they're not really working until 16, 18, 21, 25 sometimes yeah. whereas like when you were younger um, you know, you, you had, I suppose, the ingenuity and you're like, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to get a job or in the local shop. You, you just had the wherewithal to kind of uh, start little, little jobs and do, doing your own thing and driving your own business. That, that kind of came very young to you. To yeah, a couple of them I'm trying to forget because they're kind of sticking <laughs> with me, this pumpkin story, like, but yeah, that's, All right, yeah. that was one of, the, one of the many businesses I had. I had said five or six over the teenage years. Every year it was something different, but... My uh, dad was into gardening, and uh, at the time he was taking early retirement from from uh, Telecom Air, and he was into his gardening. So I was encouraging him actively to grow lots of pumpkins, yeah. and I was selling them then into the fruit and veg stores at Casper, Westport, and Ballina. Like that was a big, big money spinner, actually. You know, they're lucrative enough pumpkins, to be fair. Not great for the street credibility, like you know, but uh, nice when you're having to buy nice clothes as a teenager. Yeah. You don't have to ask your parents. So that was one. Um, you know, mum and dad might go to Dublin and I'd hop on the bus with them at 14 yeah. or 15 and up to Moore Street for bangers, rockets and air bombs, which again is something I don't really talk about publicly, but there was, there was a little <laughs> bit of that and bringing them back to Castle Bar off the train. There was nearly a few people waiting for me off the train. But uh, then we had a landscaping business, cutting lawns, me and two other guys. 
and uh, Connor and Alan, I think not NCA was the was the brand, and I was doing the marketing, and they were cutting the loans. But uh, yeah, loads, loads, genuinely, and yeah. kind of as I say, just really interested. Never really wanted to work for myself, and I think for a lot of the people in the room here that are going into the space of startups and, and creating their own businesses, it, I definitely feel, look, at the end of the day, you can nurture an awful lot, but I do feel that there's probably a deep-rooted thing in people, yeah. and it was definitely in my in my Castle Bar days. And yeah. then I came to LIT, and all that was out the window. <laughs> it was just yeah. party time. It was party was. time, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And find yourself in it. Yeah, exactly, and, uh, yeah. 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 And that's good, because, you know, every great entrepreneur will have a story, you know, sometimes it's... They're in, you know, the Himalayas or something. Yours was in Limerick, so <laughs> we're happy with yes. that. <laughs> Mine was in the student accommodation. Yeah, yeah. definitely yeah. found myself there. Yeah. Right, yeah, oh, look, that's brilliant. And like, um, so I mean, you know, so obviously it's it's you've had that spirit of entrepreneurship and been very comfortable with that at a quite a young age, um, and you you came to LIT and everything. And then I suppose just to get into the the kind of when did you decide? Well, look, you know, you went out and you got a job after college, right? And then you were like. Yeah. So you spent a bit of time kind yeah. of seeing your yeah. way around. It's funny, we were talking about it on the phone yesterday because obviously yeah. I finished college in 2000, 2002, I think it was, and there was obviously a, you know, uh, some sort of Celtic Tiger yeah. bubble thing, but obviously having, and only people who have studied economics knew that. But like it actually wasn't, like the entire country wasn't swayed in cash either, you know? No, no. Um, you had these like bubbles like Galway and, and, and Dublin and, and, and so on and so forth, but like, when I finished college, going back to Castle Bar, there wasn't that many jobs. And there were certainly no jobs in marketing. So I did marketing in college. And as an entrepreneur, I do feel that having a good understanding of marketing, I think you see the most successful brands globally now have marketeers at their core as opposed yeah. to accountants. Yeah. And the most successful CEOs nowadays are starting to become, are coming from marketing as opposed to um, accountancy. Because ultimately, every business is built around your brand and what your brand stands for. And it goes far beyond a logo, it, you know, with yeah. Trinity City, City, they've got a think way beyond yeah. just the design of their, of their logo as their brand. So um, there wasn't many jobs. So then I took a job in the Galway Mayo list, which was an entertainment magazine in Galway Mayo, distributed for free and it, uh, selling advertising. So, you know, advertising is a corollary of marketing. So I just said, okay, that's, that's for me, I'll go for that. And I turned up 45 minutes late for the interview. I still got the job, I played my alpha, he was driving me up from Castle Bar, but traffic in Galway, as everyone knows, is still terrible, yeah. no bypass, but yeah, somehow charmed my way into the job and uh, took to it like a duck to water. Essentially what I had to do was convince, you know, local businesses, nightclubs, pubs, clothes shops to, to advertise in the Galway Mayo list and uh, that lasted seven months and then yeah. that, that went out of business sadly because they maybe overstretched and opened in Dublin and it just pulled out all the revenue because we were actually doing quite well. So. So I became kind of an advertising sales guy and, and known as, as good at that. And then, again, we mentioned the phone yesterday, a, a dance music magazine opened out of Galway because these guys who were running the GPO and iClub in Galway had a, had a web domain called clubbing.com. At the time, dance music was still, you know, pretty big and uh, like, in, you know, in all the main nightclubs or whatever. So these guys thought they were on to a lottery win and they set up a magazine. Yeah. And I went in doing distribution because they, they knew I was in the office of the business that had just gone bust. We were in there, so they asked me to come in and I, I didn't have a clue like a distribution. But my job was responsible to make sure the magazines were in the shops, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I didn't know what I was doing, but kind of ended up selling advertising as part of my job and then started selling more advertising than the people that were paid to do it. So. Again, that didn't last too long, about eight months, and then the printer, again, they couldn't pay the bills, pull the plug. So very quickly, I started to realize that if you're in print publishing, yeah. you have a major challenge, which is if a printer, if you can't pay them, they can just pull your product, and once that happens, it's gone. So like, straight in it to a bumpy ride as an employee, yeah. um, and, but I had garnered a reputation of Galway as a good seller, and this is over like a 12 to 15 month period, and then, um, took a job that was offered a job to go away independent. I think they opened in Limerick as well. And again, sadly, now defunct, but they lasted a good stretch of time as, again, advertising salesperson. And um, the, the, that was tough sell because they were very much number two in the market. So, you know, the Limerick Post here has a kind of a, and obviously papers were much stronger, but they have a bit of a stranglehold on that free sheet market. Yeah. So you can imagine someone to come into Limerick trying to rival them. It's going to be difficult. So in Galway, the Galway advertiser was the premium brand, or the, yeah. and is a global success story as a free sheet to Galway advertiser. So we were the Galway independent, and 
you know, it was really a tough sell. But again, I probably thrive in that underdog, punching above my weight mentality. Yeah. Um, that came from that Castle Bar upbringing and, you know, did well. And that was, was their year. And then decided, I think, that the itch started to scratch again of I need to do something for myself. But the idea came really from dealing with clients. Like, so I was dealing with, you know, a lot of local business like it happened in Limerick, but in Galway, and imagine the challenges they'd have. So there's one guy in particular called Joe Carl. He had a music shop because um, they did actually they did actually exist. Uh, called Shabag was five of them. And he used to book in, he'd ring me and he'd book in his ad on a Tuesday. The, the paper would be out on a Wednesday morning. And because he was booking it in so late, it was at the very back of the paper. The design looked shite and yeah. the results were probably the same. So I said to him, look, how much are you spending on advertising a year? And he hadn't a clue. But again, you can start to see at this stage now, the cities were booming and he was ended up spending, he, he was spending about a hundred grand a year in advertising. So oh. I was like, if I could get him to plan that at the start, I'll take 15% and we'll design his campaign. So I was able to merge the business head that I had and my marketing head and go, well, there's no reason why his ads can't look as good as Coca-Cola, even though he's not, but I'm going to try and make his ads booked in in advance. Because if you went to the media and agreed stuff in advance with them, you'd actually get a better rate. So I started doing that and then hired a graphic designer. So had him really lined up as a first client and then left the Galway Independent and went into business full-time as Impact Media at 23, yeah, and just said, right, I'm back in now doing it for myself. And it's that, like, I mean, we often talk about here about, like, the, why most businesses fail is, like, that product market fit or that service market fit. And so having kind of gone through those jobs for, you know, 18 months or whatever and seeing those pain points, that's not working, that's not working, and why these companies are not working out and then understanding those client needs, like, very astute to that, you were able to pick that up and go, Yeah, oh, an and one of the good things about working in advertising sales is you're dealing with a variety of different businesses, so you mm -hmm. kind of know what the restaurant owner's challenges are, the beer shop owner, you know, beer brand owner's challenges are, the, the, the cafe's challenges, you understand business, so it's actually, it was actually a very enlightening period, obviously not as enlightening as my four years in LIT, but the two years I had or thereabouts, I learned an awful lot about oh, other businesses yeah. and other industries. And then when I set up a marketing business, you have to understand other businesses because essentially people walk in the door and they go, I'm going, we're doing this or we're in this business or in this field, so we're in steel. And you go, oh, shit, okay, I need to hear about steel and yeah. understand it to be able to do something for you. So then the impact media time was like great. And from we started in 2003, and you know, it actually came incredibly easy. And this is where I think you could really start to see the Celtic Tiger was bubbling behind the surface. But again, you're not going home like saying, please tell me why this is all going to come to a crashing end. You're just assuming this is, the, this is reality. And I've talked about this before, business just seemed easy. Even in a place like Galway, in a small city, and running a business to business marketing company, it seemed easy. So we went like from 2003 to 2007, just like hockey stick. Um, and I think that's obviously stayed with me in terms yeah. of I will not take Anthony ever for granted because it, when it seems easy, you, you always have to be aware of what's going to come next. So yeah. up to 2007, because a lot of people think the recession started in 2008, 2009, like it started in 2007. It probably started towards the end of 2006 and we started to see a few customers go out of business early. So we were dealing with a lot of companies that were what you might say operating on the froth of the economy yeah. that in a real normal economy they wouldn't have been room for them to exist because in 2007 there was 146 furniture stores in Galway Ooh. like Galway is the same size as like Limerick you know 100,000 people are thereabouts 146 so you can divide that down with the population you go this is unsustainable so we ended up dealing with a lot of people who were ambitious and and, and trying to set up in all the different regions and again, and look, I'm ambitious and I, I love ambitious people, but they were probably the first to go because they were just that bit overstretched. And I remember like flooring companies and stuff like that, like Floor World that started in Donegal and they had 15 shops. And we were exclusively doing their marketing and design. The next thing, boom, a liquidation letter came in. And I was like, well, what does this mean? Because yeah. I think it was Damien Dempsey, Dempsey once said, you know, don't sh t teach this shit in school and they certainly don't teach it in college. And you get this letter in and you go, you know, Christ, I'm owed 20 grand, what do I get out of this? And you get nothing. And all yeah. of a sudden you get a few more of them. And it was just like a tsunami of people going out of business. And those people going out of business then ma massively affected us because we would have been owed. I remember one particular um, motor brand or like car dealer that was all over the West of Ireland and they were our best pairs. Yeah. Like they were unbelievable. I remember one month passed and I didn't pay in the second month. We kept doing the work because they had so much credit in the bank mentally. Next thing, bang, liquidation letter comes in and like, it's impossible to recover. So we had a team of about 22 people. I was one of the youngest in the office. And all of a sudden I went from being the boss 
to, sorry, I went from being everyone's friend to being the boss. Yeah. Because I had to invoke pay cuts and all that. And all of a sudden, like I said, Ireland was just, a, you know, a, Ireland's, that we do need to forget stuff. I'm a big believer that when in business, big part of success is forgetting stuff. Yeah. If you hold on to everything, you will not succeed in business. I forget stuff that happened last week. But I do think from an Irish perspective, we have to be aware of what we've just been through because it does seem like it's been so glossed over. And even been in Limerick today in a city that I feel very, very proud of having a connection to, the scars are still there yeah. and they run deep. And you know, we can get caught up in the Facebook, Google, Twitter bubble in Dublin, isn't it great? Nice. And forget nice. that some of these cities haven't recovered. Yeah. And like actually just even like it's very interesting because they're the kind of things as well that kind of, you know, build your, your level of resilience. Uh, learn how to be a leader, a manager, as you said, go from being somebody's, you know, being everybody's friend and everything's yeah. going great and it's easy to having to make those decisions where you're letting people go, you're doing pay cuts, you've got to rally people around, people know there's something going on, but, you know, and you're, as, a, as an employer, you're helping them to pay their rent, their mortgage, put food on the table. Like that's a tough Yeah, time, and it's, it's yeah. one of the big responsibilities a lot of people in the room realise that when they step into this, I met a guy last night where actually well, I kind of opened the gin fest in Galway, which we might talk about again because it's, it's a really good business example. But a uh, chap, probably in his mid 50s, he's just set up his own gin brand. And his previous work was as a rep, we'll say, for a big drinks company. I swear to God, like he, you could tell the last year he has worked hard and his wife was there and they've worked hard. And I hope it works out yeah. for them. But you could tell, like, there's a huge challenge because when you are responsible, the big thing between working for someone and working for yourself is the door never closes. Yeah. Like metaphorically, the door just doesn't close. Now in our business, it definitely never closes. Digital is 24 seven, but back then, like it was incredibly, it was every single news report was doom, doom, doom. And I was in my twenties driving a lovely car, all these boxes ticked as that kind of classical upstart entrepreneur and starting to realize, Jesus, this is actually crumbling and there's very little I can do. And the biggest challenge we had was our clients, the people who owed us money, yeah. were, were, were paying us out of their overdraft and potentially that was getting pulled back by the bank. So you had this horrible dual, dual scenario, but very, very testing time um, from, we'll say, 2007, 2011. And, yeah. you know, those scars will stay in me as well, mentally. Like, I mean, I can live with it and cope with it, but ultimately I will never, because all the people go, how oh, do you not get carried away the success you've had? It's like, and that's a good thing. When we got to Dublin, no one knew my background at all. And have, I probably said my best education could have been running the business in Galway, in a, a marketing business, in, in going from brilliant to a shitstorm. It was probably the best learning kind of thing I could have had. So a lot of those lessons have, have yeah. stayed with me. So. And you were saying as well yesterday, you were like going, you just didn't enjoy it any more than at that point. I mean, obviously it's very stressful, uh, uh, you know, time. Um, but then even just, I suppose, the work that you were doing, I think, I, yeah, you were just saying, look, it, was, it became very stressful, we weren't enjoying it. So you started to look, you were starting then to look yeah. at other opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. I started to realise that, look, I was good at building brands, but I had just built a B2B marketing company. But we used to advertise like mad in the papers and like do full page ads called the Impact Media Express. And we used to like design as if it was the front, like if you were opening the newspaper, we'd be on page five, it looked like we had our own newspaper. And we used to like say, we've partnered, I see Supermax across the road, they're, they're one of our biggest clients. So we've partnered with Supermax to launch this or that or the other. So we were really, really famous. Yeah. I'd go into Super Value and more and the people working the counter would know me from the paper. But ultimately these people couldn't be my clients. So yeah. it was like, I was kind of going, this is actually wasted trying to build brand recognition in a B2B marketing company in the West of Ireland. I need to create something where I can drive huge consumer awareness of our brand and I'm still probably linked to the idea of advertising and that big brands who are recession proof can help me yeah. pay the bills. And yeah. that's essentially what we did with Joe. So the idea for Joe started in 2008, really, that's where the idea started. And it was like, you know, loads of magazines aimed at women, TV shows like Expose, nothing aimed at men. Now, as we've gone on, we're definitely a gender neutral brand now, but we started with a kind of a male positioning because ultimately you have to kind of stake your mast in the ground someplace and say, this is what we are. And that's, that's where the idea came into, in 2008, but I didn't start it that quickly. So getting excited again about, you know, setting up a, a, a new business, why Joe? Um, the, the name, yeah, is it? Yeah. Oh, average Joe, Joe Soap. I mean, we weren't going to call it Paddy.ie, you know, or, or Mike. Yeah, we weren't right. going to call it, we wanted something that could translate. And ultimately, yeah. again, the type of fella I am, I'm, 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 I like to think global and yeah. think worldly, and we weren't going to make it too Irish. Yet, it has 
its success in Ireland has been built on the back of its so an Irish so content so provider. Yeah. But Joe Simple, the original first name actually was Joe Soap, which thankfully someone told me was shit and just <laughs> get rid of. And I said, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, but what I had with Impact Media is I had graphic designers, web designers who built the entire brand, so I didn't have to go out and spend a load of money. So we had the website was built by the Impact Media staff, the brand, the logo, the identity. And um, was that, so in 2008, I had the idea, but yeah. like the day job kept pulling me back in. I'm sure some people are in that struggle. And one of the big pieces of advice I would say, if someone has an idea for business, but they have a, you know, well, my day job was my own business, but if you have a day job, you've got to give it up. You've got to have out no fear. Sorry, because I, I want to go back to when I started Impact Media in 2003. The fear that I had of not being able to pay myself led me to be successful. Mm. And I see a lot of people who go, I keep this job and I'm doing this thing on the side. And that's fine, but the thing on the side won't fire unless you have the fear of now you have to pay your own bills and you've got to be accountable. So in 2008, I had the idea for Joe. I was looking at Ronan O'Gara coming in as a kind of a brand ambassador. I got to know my best mate is Jerry Flannery, who a lot of you will know. And um, I got to know a lot of the Munster team at that stage. Yeah. And Raj obviously was, was probably the most high profile person in Ireland yeah. around 2008, 2009. And he's mad for cash. So he, he said, <laughs> he said, oh, I'll do whatever you need, I'll do. So I said, right, I'll come back to you. And then I had Pat from Supermax as an investor and I said, right, I'll come back to you. And I just physically couldn't do anything because you had this idea, but then you'd walk into the reality of Impact Media and I was just, you had to keep that show on the road. So by 2010, I said, I can't not scratch this, or yeah, itch this scratch anymore. Scratch this itch. God, yeah. that, that's a confusing <laughs> one. So I said, right, I'm going to do it. And I just, at that stage, I had lost a lot of interest in yeah. Impact Media because people weren't paying us and it was a struggle. So I did a deal with a company from Corp to take that business over, take the staff on, take the client list and launched Joe in 2010 from Galway, from the Oramore business mark in Galway yeah. for the first year of its existence. And the premise and the idea was, yeah, as I said, loads of magazines aimed at women, nothing aimed at men, and we weren't going to launch a magazine. Yeah. Now we would have made more money in 2010 because people would have understood it and gone, okay, I'll buy a half page ad or whatever. Would have been out of business by 2011. So I said, right, let's go with digital. I had a smartphone early. I'm kind of an early adopter of stuff like that. So I said, the smartphone is going to be a huge new way we're going to access digital. But I didn't realize how big Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram were going to be in terms of distribution channels. Yeah. So I got lucky with that. But 2010, I said it yesterday, there's gener once in a generational opportunities to launch different things. And if you look at media, be it the Limerick Leader or the Irish Times, they're both brand very similar vintage. They're probably about 150 plus years old. TV stations are often 30 to 50 years old. And there was a once in a generational opportunity that ourselves and the likes of the journal here in Ireland uh, and Buzzfeed, etc., globally took advantage of, which is probably from 2009 to 2015, there was an opportunity to create brand new media brands from dust. Yeah. And it, cause it's, but that was luck. Like yeah. I didn't know that. And no. then you know, even with because um, we talked about like, when you're then looking for investment or or support and cash, kind of get the business started and get it growing. I mean, coming from from one business and moving into to something else, especially when it's something brand new. You know, something you're creating like, like digital was a whole new category like of, of business and a lot of people maybe wouldn't have understood what you were trying to achieve. I know yeah I sent a tweet there recently that went super viral about the fact that we repaid our loan from another bank um, and uh, that helped us kickstart the business but we had a good track record with them in impact media so I had traction we actually O'Connell Street Limerick lent us about 330 grand AIB if I can say that um, <laughs> lent us about 330 grand out of European investment bank money and they that i swear to god i'd say they had about 340 grand in their account yeah like and in trust, 2010 we took the majority of it there was they had nothing we got that because it was investment but european investment this bank money they had to give out so we were very grateful to get that but the, the biggest your, they would have been yeah. doing loans at 10 million in 2005 yeah. do you know, know what i mean so it was but it was like people don't uh, it was it was a very very or odd time to go start a business. And as I said, and again, a lot of people here in the room will know that. You'll have so many people saying, don't do this, don't do that. You're just fucking saying, I'll do my own thing. And do you, you think, was it, uh, like, how compelling, like, that's, that's, I mean, it's a lot of money for, for a startup to, to get. Do you think it was your, 
your reputation, your ability to sell? Was it a compelling value proposition? It was literally a lady called Sandra Doherty in AAB who just believed in me. Yeah. And she got the bank manager on side and that is it. And so relationships. Yeah. Jerry came in and helped sign the guarantee because <laughs> allegedly high profile sports people don't walk away from loans whereas business people do. But oh, that well, was literally and then they had yeah, they had yeah, they had it well secured, I think, at that stage. Yeah. But th we had a track record with them. But it's difficult to get money, as we know, from banks. Now we've built our business with alternative debt, um, which has Can been you very successful. That, maybe? What, is, what do you mean by alternative debt? Alternative debt is that like you know, the reality of it is, you know, if you want to really scale and you don't want to give away because I wouldn't be and Peter Hunt knows this, I wouldn't be a venture capital or private equity person yet. I don't, we've kept our business to ourselves. Yeah. Because I don't believe I think we have to worry about people who uh, celebrate fun uh, successful funding rounds yeah. because that's fine, that's proven that you can convince people to give you money but you haven't proven a sustainable business model. Business success is based on sustainable profitability, nothing else. So getting funding is not success. So that's just something, that's my mantra. And other people have taken yeah. on the world, have got funding and funding and funding, that's fine but we've retained control of the business and I, I like that because you know it allows us to move freely but alternative debt is essentially there's funds out there that understand your business probably better than banks do, which are still tend to be a bit general, a bit generalist, yeah. and certainly would lend an awful lot deeper. But you pay a very high rate of interest, so you pay twelve and a half, thirteen percent in some cases. Um, but you go into it knowing these people will help me get to here, and yeah. I don't have to give away equity. So again, it's. It's ballsy it's way of doing it, but it's, it has to be done. Sorry, strategic, much yeah. better way of putting it. But <laughs> it, it, you know, it's, it's helped our business. Now, we only started that as we went across to the UK. Yeah. So we ran the Irish business with just that bank loan that we got from AIB. And then, really, you know, we, we've been profitable since 2011. First, set, the first, after the first full year, we've been profitable in Ireland. But I wasn't worried about putting money to the bottom line constantly. We were trying to, you know, hire a better standard of individual. Because when we started the Irish business, we ended up hiring a lot of graduates. And then, obviously, you know, against the Irish Times and the Irish Independent, who we've, you know, gone on to, I don't even think just rival anymore. I think we've gone on to take their market share in a lot yeah. of cases. And as such, we've had to replenish and invest into better people all the time. So you're trying to build your business, build its reputation, hire more staff and cut a bottom line profit. It's kind of, it can be tricky. And when you started, so with Joe, and you, so you left the, the other business was, was uh, had moved on. Uh, did you step out on your own? Did you bring some of your team with you? And you had, you had a couple of quid then to fund salary, I assume, because you had the website. Yeah, well, we had, we had the bank money, that funded yeah. salaries. But like for the first year, we had to, again, back to, you, you used to grow an audience. If you're going into media, you have to grow a huge audience yeah. before you can try and convince somebody that you can advertise their infinitely more famous product. Yeah. So um, the money went on advertising, and then we cracked that Facebook and Twitter, but particularly Facebook, was going to be a huge content distributor. So Joe Dottie's fame really came from Facebook. And Facebook, you know, is quite schizophrenic now. If you were to look at it, you know, a lot of people yeah. are really sick of it. But at the time, everyone was on Facebook. Phenomenal, it was the yeah. thing. And we, like, we became the place where all our videos and photographs went viral. Or if a cow was on the loose on O'Connell Street, <laughs> someone would send it to us. And yeah. then that would be out on Joe. And just this kind of snowball effect kind of happened. But how our business model was essentially always going to be funded on this branded content piece. Yeah. And we were the first to do that in Ireland or the UK. We feel at a global level. Yes, there was things called advertorials from you know, the 50s and 60s in newspapers, but we, we were hell bent on, I, again, my marketing brain was there. I wasn't going, display ads are going to fund this. Yeah. It's going to be activating a brand essence or purpose through content. So we would have worked heavily with Heineken at the start promoting the Heineken Cup, making the Heineken Cup a much bigger deal in the mind's eye of a young guy or young girl in Limerick as opposed to Arsenal, Chelsea. So you, so you had to cre create the content, I mean, then to convince Heineken to... to yeah, I, yeah, I have loads of proposals sent to Heineken in 2010 yeah. that just, you know, have probably have cobwebs on them now that we yeah. just rejected. And then our first big partnership was with Jameson. So a lot of brands have a thing called a brand essence or a brand purpose, right? So Jameson's brand essence at the time was easy going. So the archetype of Jameson drinker, because the drinks brands are phenomenal marketeers, phenomenal. Because what separates drinks from other drinks is marketing, right? Yeah. And obviously it's taste, but like it's marketing at its start, right? So Jameson's brand essence was easy going. So they were, they were doing these very lurid billboards and, and, and sick sheets and, and no one was getting. It was like two guys in a bar, well dressed, and they were looking at what, a large reptilian creature and they were like, is that an alligator or a crocodile? And the whole yeah. idea was neither of them were running away from it. But like, it just wasn't landing because you, you can only use six words of creative on an outdoor. So we said, guys, 
what will solve this is content. So we'll create a section of Joe called Easy Going Joe, and we'll do chill out tracks of the week, we'll do cult movie classic reviews, and we'll do dumb it down news. So we'll take the biggest news story of the day, yeah. and we'll dumb it down for people who don't give a shit. <laughs> and they said, class, okay, let's do that. So boom, we were in with the golden ticket of a case study, and we ran that part for two and a half years, and then all of a sudden, word got around with all the Dublin agencies, this crowd are doing this thing called content, we need to get on it. Like, so that was the first example of branded content in Ireland. So we stick to branded content. We, there's other term called native advertising. Yeah. That's not something that we do. We do branded content and it's gone on and on and on. So our, like, essentially 80% of our revenue is branded content. So partner with big brands to create content or tell their stories through our stuff. And yeah. the way big brands are moving is they want to do, you to do brilliant, engaging stuff. They're not trying to sell you stuff all along. They actually want to create good stuff because it makes them look good. So, that was, so that was 2011, then we launched her in 2012, all of a sudden we were getting a great reputation with the brands, we were growing our audience like crazy, like joe.ie had 5,000 Facebook likes, and Facebook likes, if we remember, were like this currency for how famous you were, or successful you were in a business, and we had 5,000 likes in January 2012, and I remember been out on New Year's Eve on uh, January, sorry, in December 2012, going into 2013, and we hit 100,000 that night. I was out, and like, I swear to God, the points went down heavily oh there again. My gosh. And, and the and the Jamesons, and um, but that was huge because all of a sudden, Joe.ie in the space of a year had way more likes than RTE, the Irish Times, Irish Independent, News Talk. We all of a sudden became this, yeah. you know what I mean? And, People were obsessed with starting to grow their social and so we were just so far out ahead. So and, not, and not everybody had one of these, remember? So it was... No, but they yeah, were growing. Yeah. That was the big thing. Everyone, people were getting more and yeah, more of them. Yeah. So we then launched her in mid-2012 because we had the... Repu we had, even though the mag female magazines were part of our reason for setting up Joe, we were looking at these magazines and they didn't have a digital strategy. And to this day, her dwarfs them all in terms of its size and scale. So we built that in record time. I mean, her that is, I got half a million Facebook fans in about three years and all Irish, you know, that's a big thing that we, we work on local audiences and not this kind of global, we work with local audiences. So the two brands then together, Joe and her, we essentially could work with every brand in the country. We had put a really strong team together. Uh, we were getting a great reputation, invested heavily in client service. And then we launched Sports Joe in 2014. So the reason we did that was because we, if you're talking to young men, sport can dominate the news cycle yeah so we said we want to talk about more about business and politics and movies and music and culture and whatever else so let's take sport off and create a separate sports vertical so we launched sports show in 2014 and then added her family in 2014 and then that was that's the irish business and that's yeah. grown that's grown from there and now we have about 3.2 million followers in Ireland, which is untouchable territory Everybody. versus arrivals. Well, yeah, not far Everybody off. Anyone has kids. Now, obviously, there's probably there's obviously some duplication, but Twitter followers, Instagram and, and, and Facebook. So that's a big, that gives us huge strength then when we're up against anybody because we're moving our business massively and, and there's a huge change coming in media, which is essentially we wouldn't call ourselves websites anymore. Yeah. That's why the .ies are gone. We are a distributed media business. And where media is going, you guys will see, is you're starting to consume more and more content just natively in social feeds. So we've been the first to kind of lead this wave in Ireland. So the websites are still part of our business. We can't turn off joe.ie in the morning, the website, because so many people go to it. And we had a story two weeks ago on the Notre Dame fire, or maybe three weeks ago, an opinion piece by, written by a brilliant young guy called Carl Kinsel as to why the reaction was so ridiculous when there's people dying in the world. Yeah, yeah. And that was shared nearly one and a half million times. It's the biggest story ever from an Irish publisher. So that's written word and that is literally three weeks ago. So we can't turn off our website, but our focus is on creating content that people consume as audio, as podcasts, or as long form YouTube shows, or as magic minutes. And that distribution channel has worked incredibly well. So our biggest partnerships are now pretty much all stuff that doesn't sit on our website. That's brilliant. I mean, the, the adaptability of your, of, 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 you as a, as a leader, I suppose, and then as the company to not be like, oh, we are a website. You're, you're I suppose, the, yeah. the view, the focus of what you're doing, you're, you're adaptable, you're dynamic, you're able to change. Yeah, it can be incredibly vision. frustrating for staff to keep having to go through these constant periods of change. If you look at newspapers, nothing changed but the quality of ink for a, a century. Yeah. And now we're in a scenario that from 2010 is so out of date, 2013 stuff is so out of date that we've always got to be aware of what's next. And it sounds cliched, but when you're bringing staff, like we've got staff from 
the Ora More Business Park, the very first day, it was still with us, and they changed the scene. And it doesn't suit everybody to have that level of change. And it can often come across as you don't know what you're doing because you're constantly having to change things. But yet, we generally get things right. But the model is so dramatically different to what it was three years ago. Now, what I actually think is happening is we're coming into a, a stable-ish period of digital for the first time. And it's, like, I, I would say digital is 10, is 10 years old. I, I don't, like, 2006, 2007, I mean, we're dealing with dial-ups and maybe broadband and offices. It wasn't a real thing. The smartphone has made digital a real thing. And we're starting to come maybe into a little bit of consistency now. But that change can be difficult because a lot of people get in the room bringing staffed on journeys of change can be difficult because people yeah. are programmed not to like too much change <laughs> it's true and to focus on stuff. but i'd say nearly what you're um uh, i suppose the quality of stuff that you're giving your clients the service that you're offering the job you're getting done for your clients hasn't necessarily changed uh in terms of what their the value that they get from it and how they use it to grow their own brands and and get uh, uh exposure uh, so that job that you're doing for them is continuing but how you're doing it is evolving and you're kind of working with uh, what's happening globally and being ahead of the game yeah 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 and but we're, we're also moving into a lot of different um parts of the irish business like we're moving into spaces where we're creating content for brands just for their social feeds yeah so we're saying why go to a creative ad agency leverage the skill set of a top tier media organization to make your social channels look like a top tier media organization yeah. so if you're a centra and you want to talk about hurling get us to do it don't get a creative agency because they're they're TV ad people. We're, we're actually, so that's a big new revenue generator. And we're going to be taking a big step into events as, as we go as well. Rather than constantly managing events for brands, we potentially could go into that space in Ireland. So the Irish business is going to potentially go through a lot of growth and, and change. And we're potentially going to rename the entire business because we don't feel Maxim Media is fit for purpose for the 2020s. Yeah. So, so that's, yeah. An, that's an exclusive tonight. We're probably going to rebrand and... and, and change the, the, the mothership, as it were, because it, it's not fit for the 2020s. We're a different type of business now. Yeah. Maxim Media reflects four websites. That's not what we are in Ireland. Yeah, and so, like, uh, and actually, that, that's great. It's lovely to hear this first. Um, uh, so, and, and actually, like, I have so many questions, but I'm really interested just on time as well. So then the UK market. Yeah, so UK market, um, again, it's funny, because I said, oh, in 2011, guys, I was on the f absolute floor. Like, you know, the the business had been taken over by people that yeah didn't didn't follow through on, on their part of the deal and Joe was an infant. It was tiny, yeah. right? So I literally I say two thousand eleven was really tough. No, I never lost a night an ounce of sleep. And I do believe that natural entrepreneurs don't lose sleep because you hear that cliche again, sleepless nights. So it's like if I had sleepless nights I'd get out. I would get out, but 2011, I was, we were literally like, I was personally like, yeah, wasn't, wasn't a good, t not in a mental health way, just in mm. a fucking hell, it wasn't enjoyable. And yeah. we were, things were tight for cash and the bank loan had, you know, dried up because we were paying wages and we literally needed Joe to set fire. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that, that you, a lot of people would be on that journey. They'll need it to set fire uh, their, their business. You know, it has to happen at some stage. So. Then, but, but then perversely, by 2014, it had become easy again in some weird respects. So we had just, it just did catch fire on a sex. And I was looking at, I was looking at what's, the, what's next? And I was looking at, you know, I was looking at food, nutrition. I could see that as a space. As a, the zeitgeist, I think, is important to try and get in early on things. And I could see that as a space. And then... Actually, I'll ask you on that, because how do you listen and understand your client needs. So you've got your customers and you've got your audience. So you've got us consuming content and yeah. enjoying it and taking part in the experience. Yeah. And then you're trying to meet your client needs. How do you listen? Well, from an audience, audience perspective, they're not long telling you they're not happy. So, you know, <laughs> you will have to look at the replies to a yeah. Facebook story. Which is great. You get Joe, that you yeah. fucker or something like that. Yeah. You know, it's literally, you can get that. So you're not long, you're not long getting your feedback from audiences, right? But no, I would say it was more a case of in at that stage I was I had a bit of an itch in Egypt. I was kind of not being as challenged as I could have been. Yeah. And I was potentially looking at starting another business and leveraging the brand awareness that we had in Ireland and go, well, if we're making lots of brands famous, I could create something completely new in a totally different space. Yeah. And I had looked at, as I said, food nutrition as a kind of an opportunity. And now you go around the place and it's protein bars instead of cups of coffee anymore. You know, it's like everywhere. 
But I decided, right, let's go with the UK. But it, was, it just seemed like a daunting thing. Because again, you have that thing where you were on the floor, all of a sudden things are going well. Yeah. And then you go, right, I want to push on. But I, I would say I became a conservative risk taker. Whereas in my 20s, I was just a risk clueless risk taker. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's important, again, in terms of business, in terms of how you evolve. Is, so I was like, right, the UK is clearly a good opportunity, but I need to do it in a way that does not compromise the Irish business. So what's the first thing you do? You go, right, we'll set up a separate company yeah. completely. Um, and then we, we funded it from Ireland. And throughout the process, you're kind of, there's not touch and go moments. There's moments where you're kind of going, geez, have I stretched myself too far? But what we've done in the UK, the reason we went over there was a huge opportunity, which was the misogynistic men's titles of the mid 90s were all dying off for two reasons, misogynistic content and print. Again, that age old yeah. thing. So FHM literally went into administration, I think the month after we opened. I'd love to just take the credit for it in full, but I don't think it was us. <laughs> so, so I was like, right, this is good. They're dying off. And then what you had is a couple of Facebook led publishers like Unilad and Lad Bible that again were making the same mistakes. Yeah. of these titles they were just going with toxic masculinity to beat the band it was semi-naked women it was you know advocating drug abuse Fishing it was or semi-naked women was one of yeah 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 and it could have been for, for both um <laughs> so we were like right there's a truck we could drive up this gap in the market which is men normal guys that are progressive in their outlook are you know class agnostic i think that was a big part of our success because the uk you only when you go to the uk you'll see it is every media outlet is toxic when it comes to class so yeah. the guardian is for you know obviously it's le it's it's, it's left-leaning but it's kind of middle class paper the telegraph is an unashamed right-wing broadsheet paper so it's aimed at the jacob reese mogg brigade as it were the sun then is aimed at the the impoverished working class but the right-wing version of them and you kind of come across and you go, Jesus Christ, we're going to be ignorant of class. So we're going to think that a 23-year-old guy or girl from the housing estate in Scunthorpe can go on to be a CEO yeah. of a company or a doctor. And that is exactly where the modern world is at. So we went in with this clean-cut brand, no reputation from, uh, as a dodgy, misogynistic publisher from Ireland. And all of a sudden, and we then knew how to build audiences quickly. And we had such a portfolio of brand examples from Ireland that we were able to show Netflix. They were like, we're going to a Netflix meeting and go, yeah, but what a, who have you worked with? We go, we've worked with you in Ireland. Here's yeah. the case study. And they were like, oh, Christ, okay. So straight away, we just had that huge shortcut. So again, took a lot of guts to go and do it, but then went straight into London because our, like, our rent in London is like astronomical versus Dublin. Yeah. And those are the type of things when you're setting up business, you go, genie, Mac, if we sign up to this lease for this period of time, this is, this is where the risk is. But thankfully, it's all gone well. We've grown to a team of about 80 people in London. We are the official partner with Coca-Cola on, the, on their Premier League sponsorship. Uh, Talk Sport are the other partnership in their yeah. radio station around 60 years. Um, and we're working with every, every single global brand, we're doing seven-figure deals now with the likes of Diageo and, on House of Rugby. Um, and, you know, it's been a huge success. So essentially, we just went with Joe. So one of the advantages we have in the UK is everyone is bowing down in the, uh, the altar, uh, at the altar of Joe. So we don't yeah. have this competitiveness in the teams. They're all massively... Yeah you're able to motivate staff because they're motivated by the brand that they work for and what we stand for. So we created a sub-brand called Politics Joe because one of the big things we wanted to do was, I always like shortcuts in business, provided they're proper shortcuts, you yeah. know, not this dodgy kind of thing. You can get, so we were kind of going, okay, how do we separate ourselves from the lads' titles? Well, they never do politics because they don't have the mental bandwidth <laughs> to do it. So we'll go and do politics. Yeah. So we then created these hugely successful satirical politics videos and then Brexit happened. And like Brexit is a shit show and I don't want it to happen. However, it's just been cannon fodder for us in terms of the content. So we've done Jacob rees Mog parodies, Theresa May parodies. Our last one had 30 million views where we yeah. replaced uh, Sorry, Snoop David. Dogg and Dr. Dre with her head and <laughs> rewrote the whole song lyrics. And we've got these brilliant animators who can do all this stuff. And it just builds huge fame in yeah, the brand. The so David Cameron one is very funny. David Cameron one, yeah. That was probably the first one of those recent ones. But they build huge fame in the brand. You have people like Gary Lineker and all these high profile people yeah. sharing them and laughing. And so it builds fame in the brand. So then we walk into Coca Cola and all of a sudden we're the guys from Joe. Like, it's phenomenal. It's like, 40, like the numbers are mental. So am I right? It's about 14 million uh, unique uh, kind of users, 80 million views of content every month quarter of a million listeners on your uh, rugby podcast each week. Yeah, the House, House, House Rugby, House Rugby, I'm constantly want to get to the q and is a great example of an advertiser yeah. funded programming. That didn't exist in October of 2018. And it's oh. now the biggest rugby show in the world. 
because Guinness came in and allowed us to do that. And we do it with Barry Murphy and Andrew Trimble in Ireland. And we do it with James Haskell and Alex Payne in the UK. And Mike Tyndall. And Mike Tyndall has been on because he's part of the royal family. He's told stories of, about the Queen Mum on the Christmas special. And that's just went like, you know, yeah. so we're benefiting from all this. So the business is strong in both markets. And as I said, my challenge is one is four years old with unbelievable potential. And then the other one is almost 10 years old with loads of potential, but lots of different things going on. So it's become a challenge. Like they're not at the same pace or yeah. whatever. So splitting my time has become a big challenge. So I'm a big user of Shannon Airport, it's an unreal <laughs> facility that we take for granted. Yeah. We can get a flight to London at half seven in the morning and it's sitting there waiting for you yeah. because it's the first flight out there. Whereas you go to Dublin, you don't know what time the flight's gonna go. So I'm over to London, we'll say Tuesday morning, back Thursday evening, one week and then Dublin every second week. But last year I would have been just London only kind of getting so it going. So I suppose as, in, as an entrepreneur and you know, you're, you're leading the company and so how do you, I suppose, I mean, you're learning as you're going as well, like, you know, like all of us in life, I suppose, but are you doing anything to upskill? Do you read? How do you, I suppose, you know, uh, um, continue to develop yourself? Is there anything? It's a, no, it's a really good question. I, I listened to a, a podcast, um, a guy called Graham Hunter did, and he did an interview with Damien Duff. We're all probably familiar with Damien Duff. And Damien yeah. Duff was asked, he wanted to go into coaching, and he said, um, <clears throat> he said he felt like a fool being a coach because he didn't remember how he learned stuff. Yeah. So he was found it difficult to impart that. And I kind of said, that is me. Like, I don't, I don't know how I learn stuff about digital because I don't sit down and read a book. Yeah. I don't sit down and read the Financial Times and I don't study the markets, but yet it, y you, you take in enough. Now, what I would say, the other thing is that for people in the room again, is that speciality, this classical thing of an entrepreneur could set up six different types of industries, in my view, is totally untrue. I think you have a speciality, you need to appreciate that if you're in a specific area, don't try and then go. The worst thing I could do is now set up something else in a completely, even though I was nearly going to do that. I want to stick to what I know. Yeah. And I've become, I think, the best out there in terms of what I do specifically. But I would come into a different business and I would be terrible at it, you know? Yeah. But so I don't know where I learn stuff. And it's an interesting characteristic in that I just pick stuff up. But a lot of people in the room are just going to have this huge gut instinct. And I know, again, it sounds cliched, but. It's why I don't really buy into too much mentors, mentors, mentors. Yeah. I believe that if you listen to every mentor you get, they would talk you down off every single ledge you're on. I think you have to, at the end of the day, go for, go for it yourself. I think mentors can be very valuable when it comes to corporate governance and specialities that you don't have. But the gut instinct piece, if you don't know it and feel confident about it, then you shouldn't be an entrepreneur. That's probably where you can sleep so well at night because you kind of have that gut and you're like, oh, like I know what I'm doing. Like, you know, I'm... I'm I think so. You do question it, but like, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. you, you need your sleep, so it just happens. Actually, just when you were talking earlier on about, um, you know, in the UK, I lived in, I lived in London for about 10 years, um, and so I, I get it like with the, with the class and everything. Actually, interestingly, just on the news, so in the last kind of month, uh, Joe Media in the UK, so you won a couple of different awards, so I just, I liked the, the heading. So it was like Sky News, Joe Media, and The Guardian win at the Media Awards Europe. So there you are with Sky and with The Guardian. And then yeah. and you won Publisher of the Year. Isn't that phenomenal? Well done. And then on another one, it was like Vice, Al Jazeera, Joe Media, uh, <laughs> Disney. We're not the same. I, I might look it, but we're not the same. Yeah. So, and I was just like, wow. So like, just when you think about um, uh, being in a, you know, so being naturally being able to fit in with all of these different, completely different types of kind of, you know, uh, uh, media uh, yeah. content providers. But no, it's great. I mean, you know? the European Publisher Year was was last week. Um, we bet off the uh, Financial Times and the Guardian to win that. Yeah. And I, I did send a tweet saying, not bad for a business starter in the Ormore Business Park and go away. That's, and that's, that's the reality, that's where it started. That, yeah. that wasn't that long ago. So like, again, for people that are in Limerick, you know, you, you can. And I think an important thing as well is I still live in, I live in Claren Bridge and I just drive or fly and that's it. But I can still live here from, because I want to live in the West of Ireland. A lot of people want to live in the Midwest and you can do it, but provided that you might have to, at some stage, have your headquarters in the capital. Because one of the things from the recession is that, you know, it has pulled everyone over to Dublin. And the reason for that is, like, we just don't have the infrastructure to, to, to be able to be evenly spread. And you can't, 
moan about that. You can moan about it and hope that the government do something. You just have to get like, it's so ludicrous that Limerick Cork don't have a dual carriageway. It's oh, like, yeah, it's embarrassing at this stage. But you've got to just, you've got to just get on with it and go, right, I'm going to go to Dublin, I'm going to set this thing up, or London, and I'm going to come back and still be able to live my life in Limerick or yeah. Colway, and you, you can do that. So, so um, great to be in those names, but we, uh, I feel like, and again, this is not being cocky, I feel like we're better than most of them. And the BBCs of this world, we would say, like people say, what's the future of digital media? We would say the future of digital media is traditional media done digitally. Yeah. So we did a show last year called Unfiltered, with James O'Brien, where we you know, interviewed Gary Lineker for an hour, or Lily Allen for an hour, or Idris Elba for an hour, or all these huge global, and what we were looking at was the fact that the Graham Norton couch is just eight minutes of get a few jokes out, plug a book, and pretend you know this other A-lister beside you, yeah. and it's all very staged. And we said, well, the, I, like, thankfully I can kind of say it's before my time, but the Michael yeah. Parkinson interview series, oh, yeah, yeah. That you still see with Muhammad Ali yeah. and these people, so no one was doing that. So we brought that format back, and all of a sudden, all the, all the BBCs and Channel 4s are going, how dare they, kind of, this is our turf. And it's like, yeah. well, you're not doing it. Because <clears throat> all media want to believe that digital media is cats on skateboards, yeah. dogs on treadmills, and for some it is, whereas we just don't do that. So even though the elephant on the loose will be a story you might see on joe.ie, in the UK, it's 100% original content. That's the way we went from the beginning. So it's harder work but it gives us a distinct unique proposition in the uk so we just do not do user generated content at all in the uk so it is different yeah it is completely different like we've invested a tv studio that's as good it's smaller but as good as channel four like it but it's just a much smaller it's probably maybe twice the size of this room but like we're producing and what you'll also see is we don't the word podcast is banned in our place so we do shows so you can consume them as long form audio on the podcast app but you can watch them on YouTube. And what we're trying to see, we're seeing is that we can drive people to watch shows like House of Rugby on YouTube, yeah. which is an hour long, and the view through rates are about 32 minutes of an hour of programming. So all of a sudden we're starting to see that as a big opportunity. And huge opportunity in YouTube for brands and for everybody else to create content there because RTE can't go into that space because they're state sponsored to provide content for their channel. So we're, we're seeing a big opportunity to create content as an Irish media provider for YouTube. Yeah, God, you're right focused, very strategic, talk about building a culture, don't use podcast, like that's, uh, you know, textbook stuff, but actually probably realizing it's textbook stuff that we talk to people about all the time, like that's really... Uh, yeah, but I think happens. culture and stuff like that, I think, like what's funny, the culture in the UK is substantially stronger than the culture in Ireland because they're all Joe. Mm. The culture in Ireland has been affected by the fact that we have these competing brands internally. Yeah. So you can imagine having Munster, Saracens, Leinster and some other rugby club all in one route. They, they would, it would be hard to create a communal culture, yeah. whereas in the UK, they're all. So the culture in Ireland, so we're working on, when we rebrand Maxim Media, how do we build, how do we build stronger culture in the maximum brand, or that new name, and, yeah. and that's who they're working for. Because, yeah, in a media organization, people get very wedded to the brand. So we don't have any aspirations to bring her across to the UK for that very reason. And we kind of think with the UK, it's just such an opportunity to grow. So we're creating two new international brands, so Football Joe, we feel, could be a huge international football brand because it's a global language football. Mm. And we're going to do something similar in the, in the rugby space. So we've already grown big Instagram followings. Like we've got 3 million on our Football Joe account in, on Instagram and it's growing all the time. So we can then work with partners like Pepsi and Xbox to do global deals. Yeah. And that's where we're moving. So the, the day of moving Joe into France and Australia, that's gone. And again, you need to know your limitations in business and go, that window that I talked about for setting up media organizations, that's closed. So what we have to do now is create a media slash global media brands from London and not try and recreate what we've done. Because that market's So you're not going to like hop into France and do Jordan? No, and I've only, I'm, again, I would have said two years ago we are, and yeah. I'm never afraid to say we're not doing that. Yeah. I said the whole success of business is always about going, we're doing this, okay, we're not, we're doing this. And I said, that's not for everybody. Um, but I think it's kept us on the right path yeah. to be to be that constantly that ahead of everybody else. To be able to kind of go, this is working, and then like tiny. Yeah, yeah. We see your, we embrace the platform, so Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. But at the same time, you've got to roll in with what they're doing. So we all jumped in on like a lot of the brands. I'm sure in the room, people, we all jumped on Facebook Live in 2016, yeah. and then you realise Facebook think Facebook Live is a load of crap and they're going to get rid of it. So all of a sudden you go, right, we now we can't do that anymore. Yeah. There's no point. 
And what we're seeing then is that YouTube gives us that long form show up thing and then we can combine it with the audience. So there's always a solution and there has to be when you might have invested a couple of hundred grand into your Facebook live studios. You gotta go, okay, right, this is what we're gonna do yeah. and then that will work. So, I think and, and has your business model changed then? Is it still... Ironically, I mean, I actually wrote a business plan. I'd hate to see it. I wrote a business plan for the bank because you had to. Yeah. I'd be embarrassed to look at what the hell it was <laughs> in 2000. So I would say we keep our business plan a 12-month cycle. Yeah, yeah. So you have to. You have to envision it. And I think you're going to have yeah. to for most of the people in the room, certainly, because technology has disrupted so many things. But the thing that has... Like, you know, back in the day, people used to ring 061 313 and then wait an hour for a cab. Whereas now, yeah. you just bang into your phone. So that's how technology is changing. But technology has transformed media. It's not that spoken about because traditional media don't want to accept that it has. Yeah. And because they control what's been said in a lot of cases, they're trying to evangelize that new media will eventually fall over, but it's, it's not going to. And this week, we sadly saw the Times Ireland, which is... You know, hit the hit the dust because they're selling three thousand copies of the paper. They probably put the best editorial team in Ireland together, yeah. you know. But they, you, you you have to jump into the river that's moving that direction, yeah, and you can't be afraid to do it. Yeah. And and if you don't, as I said, businesses will continue to fail if they just don't I know, go with it's, it. It's in it's like a stage where like you see this in industries over and over again. It's surprising then that they don't move. You know, what do you think is the next? Um, what's next for, for Joe? What do you think is next for digital? You know, have you got any kind of uh, comments on that? Um, I, I think I would be of the opinion that um, YouTube is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Obvious stuff, like obviously artificial intelligence is going to impact on the business. I don't want to say tonight what it's going to do because it's too, we're still too far out from it. Yeah. We have a couple of very good tech guys who are all over it, so when it does start taking shape, we will be there. But I still think that content consumption, people love, people should be like lucky in some respects now in that there's such a wealth of things. So one of the big changes that's happened is, you know, you do not have to listen to a two and a half hour radio show anymore because a combination of someone else's music, some lunatic from Athlone winning the competition, the death notices in a lot of cases on retail stations. <laughs> you don't have to go put yourself through that anymore. What you can listen to is 45 minutes of stuff you're interested in. Yeah. So there's a bunch of entrepreneurs in the room. They can listen to an entrepreneurship podcast like How I Built This. They, we're living through unique, unparalleled times. A rugby head can listen to 45 minutes of rugby. They don't need to listen to 15 minutes of horse racing, 10 minutes of rugby, 10 minutes of football. So what, everything's going very curated. So if you look at Instagram, it's all built around curation. So give me that one thing I'm interested in and I'll follow that account and I'll take another account. So the challenge for us is growing a mainstream media brand on Instagram is going to be a challenge. What we have to do is take our verticals and split them up. So we grow football Joe, we grow rugby Joe, we grow politics Joe as separate verticals because, because the world is moving towards this curation of like, I want, I'm just interested in this, these three things and that's all I'm interested in, thank you very much rather than force feeding people this general stuff, which is a huge challenge for something like the Late Late Show. Yeah. It's a massive challenge to keep everybody happy because you're in the situation where nobody in the room, I put a bet, are interested in country music. Yet every season, there's probably one down the back actually, every season, every season, Peter, every season there is a country music special because they've got to feed what they see as Middle Ireland. And yeah. The lens. You'd be surprised <laughs> a few people who are mad at it, but anyway. Yeah, well, they're present company except <laughs> Julian. But generally, it's, it would, what, what you know what that'll do is that'll turn off a hell of a lot of other people. They'll go, yeah. what am I doing? And how are you then going to get a 23-year-old to watch the LA show and to see this thing? So media has changed to such an extent that you've got, it's got more and more creative, more and more tailored. But the benefit for everyone in the room is then you, can, you probably enjoy media more because you're enjoying these very specific things that you want to watch. Um, so, so that's that, that there's some of the big big changes and that's why this distributed media model is where we're moving to rather than this what's your biggest challenges now at the moment I can say um, uh, what's our biggest challenge um, we talked a little bit about talent yesterday and yeah t talent in Ireland is a challenge yeah. right Facebook Twitter LinkedIn Google we all talk about these massive positives I mean Ultimately, they've had a huge, they've had a lot of negatives in Dublin because Dublin is now in a MIA headquarters. So I'm not paying Dublin rent, I'm paying a MIA yeah. city headquarter rent. So I go to Manchester, I'll get the same size office for seven grand a month that I'll get for 20 grand a month in Dublin. So that's a challenge. Then the staff, the skill shortage, again, if I go Manchester, Dublin as an example, 
I've got a Manchester, and if I was going up there now thinking, okay, Google are based there, Facebook are based there, HubSpot, Salesforce, I'd probably be going, who's available? Yet, this is the situation we find ourselves in our capital city. Um, so that's a challenge, like yeah. talent is a challenge, and then we're always hiring people that have never done a specific job before because we may have created the yeah. new job. So we talked at the last day that we now need what we're calling a program director. Now, a program director is someone who would have worked in Limerick 95 FM and decided what the shows consisted of from morning to evening. Yeah. We now need to find someone who can do that in the digital age. So that's a scary proposition because you either bring someone who's done it in the radio station and go, this isn't the radio station, or you bring someone who's never done it and try and teach them. So these are big challenges because a lot of the roles we've created never existed Existed, before. And a lot of people have transitioned over. So we brought Dion Fanning over from Sunday Independent, one of the best writers in the country. He transitioned and took the digital like duck to water. We might have brought a contemporary across and they would have gone, I need three days to write this article and that's it. And you can't do that in digital. Yeah. So um, there, there are some of the challenges that we face. I mean, again, like everything in business, you know, when there's a veneer of success, there's always going to be day-to-day challenges. Yeah. Like we could, the reality is we could defame somebody in the morning. That's just some of the stuff that you have to be aware of. Now we've got media training, we've got this and that and the other, but there's plenty of stuff that would, that, but I've got a great team of people who manage that. So there's been a buffer created between me and maybe some of that stuff day to day. Yeah. Then you can get a frustrating thing where you don't hear about stuff until it's too late, but if you don't have the buffer. Like I would say, if I knew everything going on in the business today, I would literally not be able to go in tomorrow. So you're a So I would be, no, I think, you know that thing about an ostrich and having a head in the yeah. sand? Yeah. That's actually occasionally useful because yeah. if you face every problem head on all of the time, bye bye, you just not, won't be able to handle yeah. it. You gotta be able to take in enough information enough of the time uh, and, and it's just knowing those limitations but what I'd say is as you go on in life because you become much more aware of your strengths and weaknesses it probably makes you better at business and there comes a tipping point then where you become out of touch yeah. and, and, and that will come for everybody but I think as you evolve in life as a person like I'm a more clued in person than I was 15 years ago so I have to be a better business person yeah. um, so there's great, there's great things like that but the, the challenges are always there's always challenges around the corner always challenges around the corner yeah. I remember writing an article before that in startup world like it's about I think I was, I was kind of watching the Olympics at the time and like you know there was someone who just broke a record for sprinting and it was like you know that's so the opposite of business business in athletics would be to hurdle jumpers because every single day is a massive hurdle and if you can't jump those hurdles then business is going to be difficult. Yeah. And the amount of people that have had great ideas but can't jump hurdles and they're, they didn't work at it or they have to leave or they have to give it up. And, and look, that's fine because one of the things in business is you have to be good at so many things. You have to have the idea, then you have to be good to be able to talk to banks or accountants and talk on their terms and understand that. Then you've got to try and create a culture. So are you going to actually be, are you going to be able to be a leader if you're all those other things? These, these are some of the challenges you face. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult to find, find this entrepreneur that can do all of these things. Yeah. Ultimately, you need to find a management team who can, who can fill in those blanks for you. That's it. And how many people call you Joe? <laughs> well, I go home to Castle Bar, I just get roared out on the street. Joe the Ray! How are you doing? That's it. Like, so, uh, yeah, it happens, it, happens, it happens quite a bit. But it's happening less, less and less. But, uh, yeah, it was uh, quite funny for a while. Someone sent me an yeah. email the last day and they, 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 they said, the reply then after so sorry no I don't so it, it still happens but I live with it I, I get over it it's all yeah. right yeah as long as someone start calling me her I think I'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. but that I could happen too um, I think like thank you so much I could ask you a gazillion more questions but um, it's been fantastic to to hear about your story and uh, I think we go to Q and A now as well I'm sure uh, there's lots of questions here um, uh, that we can we can kind of share around so thank you very uh, much question. oh uh, Peter. So um, I'm just curious, so you said the digital age is like 2018 now, and it's interesting, like that's pretty much Facebook's lifespan, so it's kind of lived, it's been that constant in the background in the digital age. And there's a lot of talk at the moment of, and Mark Zuckerberg actually addressed this at their annual conference about basically the town hall and what that means in the living room, and that's kind of in response to Facebook's a very expensive distribution channel. So I'm sorry, I have a couple, a couple of points around that, but I'll there eventually. You were chatting over in the, the, the boy a couple of years ago, you said you're going to spend a million dollars in Facebook ads in the next year. I can't remember, it was a couple of years ago. Has that business model changed? Like, are you looking at some new distribution outside of paid social? Is that a concern for you or, or, or no? 
Oh, so like what you'll find is if you produce good content, you will still get the lion's share of your reach through organic content. We will because we're a publisher. The reality is a brand who is a coffee shop won't because in theory they're not adding anything to the news feed. We're seen as content creators. But paid social, I think we've embraced. I think it's natural. What we're, what we're fortunately able to do is that when you have a 3.2 million social audience in Ireland, we get a certain amount of people organically, but then we always be able to hit our KPIs because we can reach people who are our existing fans of Joe. So therefore, we don't stick out in the news feed like a sore thumb. Whereas you've had a couple of new media brands come out of nowhere with no audience and they're spending money, they're partnering with a brand, they're spending money to get into news feeds to hit KPIs, but then they don't offer, they don't have the value to be in the news feed. So what we try and do is we, do high impact stuff like we're doing in the UK around politics to build equity in our brand so it stands for something. And then that's why other brands then, when they collaborate with us, they get a sense of kudos. I remember the guys in Guinness, you know, said we're making Guinness cool because the Telegraph in the UK had a much stronger heritage than we had in rugby, but we were a much thicker, more relevant for now brand. So, this pay distribution is something we've embraced and because we can target people that are already fans of our own, it, 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 we, we, we do it an awful lot better than other people. But what I would say is Facebook are like, you know, it's funny because Zuckerberg is at the top, it's so easy just to pin everything on him because he's kind of this character that can just go, oh God, he, 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 he symbolizes everything that's wrong with the world. But Facebook as an organization is incredibly culpable. So when, we, when I spoke in 2015, that was before Brexit, before Trump, Facebook has been at the core of that at the core of scaremongering, fearmongering, and distribution of hate. And the reason for that is because they built a platform so big they could not manage, and they could not control. And, and they, had a, they had an out, you know, there was always oh, the platform. Well, you see, so what they did then was a year ago, they decided we're gonna de-rank news because news can be negative. And instead of just coming out and saying, we made fake news go viral on the daily for a year and a half. And instead of coming out and saying that, they tried to say, maybe we're going to downgrade news because what we've seen is that local news providers that are authentic like ourselves and our fans have retained our traction we drive serious audience still from facebook but search has become a bigger tool for traffic so we went on a big journey from an seo perspective and because joe and her are monstrous websites in terms of how often they're updated and so on and so forth they we will rank incredibly high so last year heard that i broke four million unique visitors in a month. Wow. And Love Island was on the exact same month. So people were searching the Love Island contestants, not me, and <laughs> finding content on her, and boom, it went viral. So search is a big part of the site piece. But remember I was saying the distributed media pieces we like, so YouTube, good partner, Google are good to work with. <clears throat> Facebook are still in that, you don't know where you stand with them thing. But we, but they're doing, making a good job of Instagram for now, but you know. Well, Instagram doesn't drive traffic to the site, so we only use Instagram to share video. So on the site, search will probably account for 45%. Direct is actually up and up and up by 20%. And then Facebook will be down to maybe 25%, mainly because we've grown all the other areas, but it's probably consistent. It's probably held <coughs> pretty consistently for the last three or four years because they need people. So when Facebook go, we're gonna take news out of the news feed. They go, our content. All of a sudden, the 27 year old that you had posting content isn't posting content there anymore. Why? Because you put them over onto Instagram. So when they put their nice paleo meal or what they lifted in the gym, it's on Instagram. They're not going to come back and post to Facebook. So you have no content provider. So what are you going to do? Oh, you have to put us back in the newsfeed because you have no content otherwise. And that's the reality. If you look at Facebook now, it is a mess. The newsfeed is a mess. And, and the other issue is that they've had is everyone's parents have jumped onto Facebook. Yeah. And that is the quickest way to lose your young audience when your parents are in there. But all essentially is Facebook is now is, is content providers like us creating videos or whatever. And there's some awful, ugly, messy stuff. So I thought the Facebook refurb was gonna be much more beneficial. I thought they were gonna take out dogs and skateboards and make it clean. And it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. And we're still sticking in with it, but it's got an aging demographic They've obviously bolted everything on Instagram and WhatsApp. That's why the founders have left both those companies. Um, and I would say Facebook is a brand that I don't know if it's going to be the future of their business in 10 years' time. I think they'll look back and go, that was the thing we made all our mistakes on. 
and we're going to make WhatsApp and Instagram our, our thing. The people of... Uh, pa possibly, and that can happen. But even if you look at Instagram, like Instagram is built on vanity. Like there's some challenges around what Instagram is. What, you know, Twitter is built on intelligence, but then it's abused by trolls. So, you know, I need intelligence in the sense of to have an opinion on something, but then it's just abused by people who have terrible opinions. So this is the challenge. But social media isn't going anywhere. And that's the big thing everyone needs to realize. Well, YouTube is going to be the biggest. Okay. Yeah, YouTube is going to be the biggest, and I think Instagram is going to have a, is having a major ascent, and and it will probably stay there for a while. But I'm saying the fundamental questions of Instagram will will come to the surface more and more of, of how it makes people feel. Snapchat, don't forget. Do, I wouldn't write off yeah. Snapchat. It's still huge with the teenage audience. We've done a couple of very successful parts of Snapchat. The audience numbers were were massive. Um, but I don't think Facebook is going to be in the mix, if I'm honest. I, I, I'm a massive Twitter fan. I love Twitter as a platform. Um, but the, it, it has its challenges still in terms of monetization. But I still think it's a great platform. The problem with Twitter is that they should have allowed people to add people up to a level. Mm. So Twitter was built on this culture of you followed famous people. And therefore, you had to have some level of fame in order to get followers. So then ordinary people joined it. Then they sent out tweets, then they had no followers, then they stopped sending out tweets. What they should have done is allowed people to add people like you did in Facebook back in the day to maybe a thousand. So all of a sudden you go, okay, if someone's got a hundred thousand followers, they're obviously clearly interesting. Yeah. And that they're following a thousand, but everyone's following a thousand or has a thousand followers. That could have been the baseline. When the baseline is 13 people, people won't tweet. And if people stop tweeting, then they stop using it. And the classic thing you hear from Twitter is, if I was to interview someone, oh yeah, I kind of you, I kind of look at stuff. I would never, I don't tweet myself, and that's part of their problem. So the, they've obviously created a scenario where if you like something, it can go into a news feed. If you comment, it can go into a news feed because it used to be just retweets. So they're working to make it more shareable. But the problem with Twitter in terms of audience measurement is interaction. So just lastly on that, there's some weird anomalies. 2009 Grand Slam winning rugby team. Look at their Twitter followers and look at the Irish current team Twitter followers. You're talking quarter of a million followers for someone like Jamie Heaslip or Keane Healy and you look at current players like Jordan Armour, 4,000. And they ain't growing because, yeah, because Twitter kind of peaked in 2009 yeah. and people who were famous then were these first account to follow and they built these huge audiences. So there's challenges in that platform too, but I'm, I'm a big fan of Twitter if used correctly. And it's, uh, just a quick one on that, like, I mean, the Twitters and the Instagrams in particular and, and even Facebook with the likes, like this habit forming, you know, of, um, oh, something cool has happened, so I have to share it. It's not real till you share it. And we've all talked about it, you know, like this, this well, some people call it fake life or whatever, but the, the habit forming then, in, or with Twitter and the text speak, you were limited to 140 characters. With 280 now. Is it too easy? Yeah, you haven't on Twitter um, in a year, do you? Yeah, and then, like, and then with, with Instagram, it's again, you have to be very concise. It's a, you've got that one photograph out of a thousand that you, you share. But to be concise on Instagram or good at Photoshop. Yeah, good at Photoshop. Or fa face tuning. Okay, so, so, all of this kind of stuff is kind of driving around a, a, a habit forming for your users and stuff. Yeah. So, it's kind of interesting uh, how, we, how it has affected our everyday life as well. But yeah, yeah. It'll change. Yeah. Uh, there's people who drive to beaches. I can't to, read a long to, message anymore. <laughs> I know, yeah. Well, yeah, there's people who drive to beaches to, to take an Instagram picture and then get back in the car and go home. Like that, that's a real thing among 20 somethings. Yeah. Sorry, I've been very harsh. No, it's a real I, thing among a lot of people. Yeah. It's funny, oh, that's grand. I've done that. I've shown that I was at the beach. <laughs> yeah. Weird. A memory, yeah. Can we go for a question? Um, no, it's a fascinating uh, presentation. Um, it's an unbelievable journey. I can't imagine what the next four or five years is going to be like. I just want to ask you a question about some of the challenges. And you mentioned talent and you know, a scary prospect trying to hire people for skills that don't exist. So yep. there's a lot of transfer. Yeah, some, some, ha some have. It's funny, we've got an MD in the UK now and you can see how he prioritises culture as much as he does commercial success. And that's a rare characteristic because I mightn't have seen that as such an important characteristic. So someone like Gav will be just on an incredibly long journey with us and he gets 
the challenges, the ups and downs, all that. He actually had a a, a, a small business himself and it didn't go it, it, like it should, could have gone. So therefore he probably accepts that. So he's maybe that entrepreneurial understanding. Uh, but then we have others that have come in and come out even in the senior management team. We probably have a core group of maybe three of the six that have been there and solid for four or five years. So my chief financial officer, Ronan Doolin, like he's been there for four years and has seen all sorts of ups and downs as you can imagine, where he thinks I'm crazy because we're off doing this thing and whatever. But um, it can be a challenge and it's mainly because we get poached and I know your CPL because you introduced yourself earlier. We are a target for recruitment agencies. So, you know, independent news and media needs something from digital will we go to digital university which is maxim media and i'm not being cocky saying that that's how it was viewed so holding on to that particularly on the commercial side has been a major challenge because someone goes in and goes i've just been offered 15 grand more to go up to talbot street or wherever we can't keep counter offering one of our people was taken by a radio station group that wanted to transition into digital um you can guess kind of maybe who that was and they were offered 80 an 80 percent increase and they were on a big salary. And we just went, off you go. Like as in, we really value you, but we can't be held to ransom. So, no, I'm not saying recruitment agency was involved in that or anything like that, but we are a target. And that then has created a slight culture where we end up losing, I'd say, 20% of our staff. And then that kind of is seen as staff turnover, yet two of the challenges are we're target, and then we have people in their 20s and 30s. And the easiest way for any of those people to get more money so if you're 25 by the time you're 32 is to move and because you can just move and move and move might look great in your cv but i guarantee a lot of those people so i i've gone from being well f them anyway to i understand i am they're yeah. in it for themselves they gotta look after their family and what a great value proposition as well to say to that you, <coughs> you can work with me like you're now like i'm starting to say that to certain people that we're bringing in i actually am starting to embrace that and go look you could be here for life or you could come in and get three years on your cv from our place we're a success story, it'll benefit you because it actually can often be a little hook to bring people in on so you can understand that. So you've got to have a bit of a dexterous approach. As we said, you know, there's no such thing as a job for life anymore or it's quite rare. And then the challenge we have, because we're digital, a lot of people could come in and not feel secure because there's a bit of the radio station thing, you know, Larry Gogan defied the odds because every other presenter was had to be relevant to the audience. But we've seen that where some people have felt, you know what, on the Joe editorial team, it's time to go. I come in at 30, maybe I'm 40 now, maybe I'm not as relevant. And, 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 and ultimately, we do have to replenish the editorial teams quite regularly with, because vernacular has changed. I remember telling the guys in 2014, I said, stop doing Father Ted references. <laughs> like genuinely, stop doing them because this show is 20 years old. It would be like being in the UK going, talking about only foods and horses all the time. Yeah. You gotta let go of the stuff. And like, do you know, like the, the, the Gen Zs nowadays are just, just have a different language. So, We've got to be able to talk to them and then still be relevant to people who've grown with us and that that can be that can be a challenge mm -hmm. so you got it you have to spread your editorial team so to go back to the senior management piece we definitely have outgrown certain management teams and that's a big cultural thing you know where you see that if you're here and then all of a sudden your company comes here not everybody can step up and some people will come out of their comfort zone and thrive and other people come out of comfort zone and absolutely go Get me back into that comfy blanket, please. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not part for this. Yeah. So that that is a constant frustrating challenge. Like as I said, if we were reading, running a magazine and it was 1980, it would be sh much more straightforward or ascent. Now I don't think we would have had the success because the barriers would have been so high. And barriers to entry is a very important part of business. One of the advantages of the recession, because we started in 2010, was the barriers to entry were very low. So when we left the Oramore Business Park, we got into Marion Square, so I'm digressing here, and we got about a 2,000 square foot office in Marion Square for 14 grand a year in 2011. And that same office would have been 50 grand. So all of a sudden we were lording it in a Georgian <laughs> dwelling in 2011 and cursing the broadband because of the big thick walls. We're going, what a great place to be for low money. So even in a recession, there can be big opportunities to grow. But, and that's why there's disaster capitalists like Jacob as well who want Brexit. Lots of people want Brexit because they want assets to plummet and then the wealthy will become wealthier. But it'll affect the poor people massively. Because a lot of people wonder, well, why are these people pushing Brexit? Now I've definitely gone off tangent. Yeah. But uh, that, that's why disaster capitalism is an actual real thing. And there's some really bad people in the UK leading working class people astray. Yeah, 100%. Yes, sir. Um, that shop was now closed, but there's only a lot of 
Are you about to spill one? <laughs> Sorry, I'm, uh, kind of, it's kind of linked to social audience growth in that that has become more difficult. Like, so I don't want to go to people and say, I t you know, don't chase us because I don't want to be chased. I'd be like, I want anyone to do whatever they want to do. I think the social audience growth is linked to certain stages and we can see that we can grow because we've kind of at a level where we can swallow up people, but our Facebook growth will obviously be an awful lot slower than it was. You're not, you're not seeing that kind of hockey stick piece. And you'll see it yourselves in, it's a little bit like the rugby player thing I said earlier, you could launch Limerick today, right, uh, as, a, as a media brand. And you probably, the reality is you've been two or three years time and probably we have still only have 3,000 Twitter followers. I can't put my finger on why that is completely, but if you don't have big social audiences, it can become uh, difficult to be taken seriously then as a media brand because people go, oh, well, you're, not that, you're not that well known. So that's kind of why my view is there. And then I'll also look at who have been the breakthrough successes from 2013, 2014. And there hasn't been a huge amount. So, uh, without, uh, without wanting to rain on anyone's dreams, that's just my opinion, and I, I think anyone should just follow their own opinion. But I just think it's that it's linked to social audience growth. It's not yeah. as fruitful as it was. And it's actually there's a lovely um, graph we often use. It. It's called opportunity landscape. And if you imagine like a kind of graph, but when you look at uh, what's important and what's already needs are being met, and it's potentially saturated space, so it's harder to kind of not such as in, yeah. No, I agree. You know, like. Do you need to like another thing? Do you need to follow another thing? If you I, kind of get yeah, I I think but then obviously the opportunity can happen when if yeah. if traditional media don't keep right. changing and the opportunity yeah. for us was the Irish Independence and the Irish Times and again great well the Irish Times certainly great media organisations but they they didn't keep up with the times like they ignored social media till about twenty thirteen and we had stuck in there you know what I mean so. Um, as Gillian said, it's kind of the needs are met and it can be difficult, but then if people get stale, now our whole thing, our whole business is built on never getting stale, which again is not for everybody because you're constantly, like I know I will become stale for the business at some stage. Yeah. So um, that's just why I think, I think social audience growth is a challenge for people now and if you don't get that, it's kind of hard to get the credibility. But there might be other opportunities. But totally, I think YouTube again presents a good opportunity to become a content creator and that's where I'd be putting my focus. I think there's an opportunity for people in Limerick to, occur and to become, could I become the Limerick Post of YouTube for the area? Could I tell Limerick stories on YouTube? That's where I'd be going. I'd try to yeah. build all my success on that platform. Because it's a little bit like the, the age old wine era story, isn't it? Like where the Erlingus and the British Airways and all of those kind of companies just thought, this is never going to work. You know, it's, it's Ryanair and, and again, just waited way too late to kind of get in on the game. And you see it in lots of different industries. And it's amazing, isn't it? Like that, that the, the traditional media, they knew it was coming, but they did nothing about it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Someday it might happen to, to Joe, that's what you're hoping yeah. it would happen, you know? Well, exactly, that's why we have to say it fresh. And, and VR could take yeah. over. And this is it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I'm going to do one more question. Yeah. Does anyone, you know, any questions? Yeah, I just want to Sorry. Sorry. Uh, this lady over here has been Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a good question because I, I would definitely say that by me wanting to stay in the west of Ireland, personally, will that affect out and out business success globally? I don't think there's any doubt that that's the case. And that's something that I can reconcile myself with at the stage of life I'm in now. In my 20s and the way business culture is built, where it's like you go and you take over the world and you get on planes and you do this and you do that. Like the reality is, I have a young family, I just, I just, you know, it's difficult enough going across to London. So you get to a point where you go, well, if I do this, that will be more than enough. Will I be able to put, will I be able to look after my family and future, their future families? Yes. Will I be able to put something back into society? Yes. And that can be enough. So again, it's kind of linked to that, um, that uh, kind of more thought through risk taker that I've become. It, you, you do have to look after yourself. You have to become, um, you have to look after yourself because yeah, there's a lot 
there's a lot riding on my brain. So you have to keep your, your brain fresh. And that's what the West of Ireland actually gives, ironically. I think if I was living in London, I'd burn out. So when I go to London, I have no interest in meeting some mate from college on the tube, two stops down for a pint. Zero. I'm over there to work. That is it. And then get me on the plane back. And I look at people outside the pub and go, fair play to you. That is a great culture. I love it. But I'm just not there to do that. So the personal sustainability thing is absolutely a great question and vital um, if you're the figurehead of the business. And then there will be a time where I won't be the right figurehead for the business. And you need, need to know when to step off as well. So, um, and I, wouldn't, I would definitely wouldn't say I go around acting like I'm top dog. Top dog. I know, like, literally, you might, you might, I'm still, like, very, very grounded. Grounded to the point of, and I think we said, so the thing about Roy Keane, where Roy Keane will allegedly, I don't know this personally, but I kind of know the story, will turn up for a 10 grand opening of whatever, because he, he has this thing from his Cork upbringing, he believes he could lose everything. So you kind of go, Jesus, why is this guy who's on this amount of money? Why will he not turn up? And allegedly he'll do it because he keeps wanting to feather that nest, as it were. Yeah. And I definitely have the same thing where I believe it could all go. And that just does, is a healthy dose of keeping you going. Fire to just to go, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, not that you never have enough. Did you just think you could lose it all? It does drive you. And I, I do think that's in me as well. I think that running through business through recession is... Yeah, has put me in that kind of Here. stage, yeah. So someday I will want to exit or partially exit the company. There's no doubt about that because that's when you get real tangible success. I mean, the tax laws are very archaic here. And like, you know, look, at the end of the day, if you've done well, you've done well. And, that, and my commerce teacher used to teach me, oh, sure, you can't do a tax. You're doing well. Like, but, you know, there are things where entrepreneurs are not going to reward it. First million on a sale, 10%. Uh, and then everything over that is 33% of the government. Where in the UK it's 10 million. Yeah. And, and why that? I might not always sound figures, might sound, well, shouldn't that be great if I would have? But you cannot essentially reward a guy who buys a house in Thomond Gate and rents it to students and gets capital appreciation as the same as a girl who's gone and set up a business and created 100 jobs. You cannot reward those people in the same way. So there's major challenges. The thing about, and I'm digressing again, I'm not going anti government here because it's too easy to do, but this one size fits all strategy is ludicrous. So why should a business in Limerick pay the same corporation tax as Google and Facebook? Yeah. They're here because it's low corporation tax. Why then should we pay the same as them? Yeah. So how do you get jobs at the regions? Well, incentivize people to create startups in localities where they could maybe not pay employers for your side, which is an absolute ludicrous tax. It's a tax on giving someone a job. Yeah. Like people don't realize this in business. If you're giving someone a job for 40 grand in the morning, substantial salary, You've got to give another five grand to the government just for the privilege. And the person only gets, whatever, 30. Yeah. It's madness. But like, obviously you've got to have the good tax take, but you could apply some simplistic things and go, Do you know what, first five years in business, maybe I'll make a profit, maybe I'll make a loss the following year. Do you know what, because you're only five, less than five years in business, we let you keep the profit for a rainy day. No, straight in, give us that. Yeah. And it's just one size fits all. It's mm -hmm. infuriating. So. Um, that is not the question, but there you go. I wanted to get that out today at some stage. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, look, I think. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, we'll do one more question because you've been waiting. Yeah. Well, um, well, the question I wanted to ask you is because it comes from how I built this by Guy Ross. Obviously. Yeah. Uh, how much do you attribute your success to your skills or to the book? Oh, yeah, it's a good, good, good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, luck is a massive part of it, right? And then, by conversely, being unlucky is an, an awful reason for people's demise. So, luck is a big part of it. And this, you know, a lot of cliches can still be very applicable to business. And, like, I had one part of it in that I knew the smartphone was going to be a content distributor, right? So, we just open up on that for a second. Why digital consumption has gone through the roof has been because of the smartphone. So if I'm meeting Gillian for a coffee and she's five minutes late, I'm like sound on my phone. I can sit in the pub now and not be awkward. Like I want you, we all were 10 years ago, <laughs> just go on the phone, sound, because everyone else is on their phone. But that's led to this huge intake of digital culture. And it means also one of the downsides to that are this misperceptions is that then, I've talked about this before, that young people have bad attention spans, which is complete shite. It's because you might only have five minutes. So I give me a minute of video and I'll watch that. Well, I haven't got time to watch 45 minutes. But I'll go home and I'll watch 45 minutes on YouTube or listen to it in the car. So attention spans have not diminished among young millennials or Gen Zs or any of that. So 
So I was aware of the smartphone, but I was not aware that Facebook, Facebook primarily and Twitter were going to be the thing that exploded our brand awareness for free into people's homes. So when I was doing the business plan in 2010, I was thinking, we actually advertised with Today FM quite heavily in 2010. Because I was, as a marketeer, I was going, right, well, that business plan, I'm going to put this for this, but I need 20 or 30 grand for PR and for radio advertising. Because Today FM was like a, a monster back then. And I'm not saying it's not as much anymore, but obviously digital has taken away stuff from everything. So the look piece came from, yeah, I said, I didn't realize that. And that, that, so look is a massive part of stuff. And then, but I think there's people say the harder you work, the luckier you get. And I, I think that's true as well. And the more chances you take, uh, the luckier you get. And again, you know, <clears throat> business is not for everybody. You've got to be able to sit, have, risk has to be able to sit well with you. And you've got to be able to deal with, uh, like I don't like this failure thing, you know, which is kind of perpetuated by a lot of American business philosophers where it's kind of consistent failure. It's all great, have seven car crashes in a business and then get up again. I would say have one or two and then maybe we need to see whether you should be driving the car anymore. Do you know what I mean? That's what I think it should be. Because in Ireland, it's difficult to just go, I'm going to get a hundred grand off that person who lives in Killaloo. And I, I, sure, if it doesn't work, uh, you know, that person might be able to sit with that and might see them. Like an awful lot of stuff built out of, so I love that podcast, by the way, but an awful lot of the people he's talking about are built out of Silicon Valley, right? This La La Land, which is like fail. Yeah, and, 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 but, but a weird metamorphosis, metamorphosis today is that like venture capitals are built for nine of their 10 businesses to fail and the one that works, they will make their money back on. Where that's applied to Ireland is very risky. Then it creates a scenario where you're buccaneering and you're not afraid to take a bank loan on your back and then you're not afraid that it, well, not that you're not afraid it fails, but you're not seeing the consequences, which could be personal guarantee, saddle stitch debt to your back. Mm -hmm. And I had a debt coming out of, uh, Impact Media with the bank that I had to deal with and pay off in full, and it, it was it was there for a while as another as another thing. So I don't think this fail 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 thing. I think maybe, yeah, if you fail once, get up again and Learn maybe first. second time. But Jesus, if you're not learning the third time, yeah. you know, then I, I think I think you shouldn't be I think you shouldn't be in, in business in that regard. But there is there is that culture uh, in creeping in a little bit. I, I'm I'm kind of wary, but I think it's setting people off on the wrong footing. Crazy. Yeah, there's a rival of ours called Vice Media who has a four billion valuation and they've never made a profit. So it's, it's madness. Um, but that's very, very, very Americanized. And it, it, you're right. And the reality of it is, well, the reality is on Uber, like, the funny thing is, like, I met in my impact media days, I'd say a thousand people with this, the, a similar type of idea. But just being in that place where you can get it funded is, is, is for the big global stuff. But I would also say is that. I, I think what where, who's here to help someone who wants to be again I'm looking at Supermax there but someone who wants to take them on just that Enterprise Ireland aren't thinking like that it's how do I go from zero to a hundred million tomorrow and if you don't come, don't come near me it's like what's happened to one restaurant two and then if that's going well and we build a culture we've got a three how, where's the support for those people it's not there it's all this we need to build global companies in the morning and the reality of it is that is not easy and um, And he interviewed the guy behind Union Square uh, Cafe, who they basically only operate in Union Square in New York. But they went on to create um, a really good, I can't, can't think of the name of the chain now, like as a hundred restaurants across the globe. But reading about their culture was fascinating because it was all about the people. And yeah. the people and the people and the people. And then they eventually grew yeah. because they needed new experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, exactly. But they were funded through you know, local yeah, yeah. As opposed to VC and investment, and like you said earlier, like this idea that you're being really successful when you get investment, but... No, you're not. You're not. You're not. You're not. Exactly, you're not. Sustainable profitability is the only proof of business success, but I that, that, that example is very good. Like, those people in the current environment would be frowned upon. They'd be like, ah, oh, sure, they're never going to make anything. You need to give people an opportunity. Someone might say, do you know what? I think Bobby Kerr isn't doing a good enough job in coffee shops. I'm going to ride with him. At the moment, you won't get much support to do that because it'll be create a coffee app. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That'll be t downloaded everywhere in the world. Yeah. And it's just, 
Not, they're very few and far between. These, these, um, yeah, the the, the uh, unicorns, etc. You know, and this again, this whole uh, it's a unicorn or nothing kind of nonsense. Like you know, it's yeah, sustainable business and starting from scratch and building is kind of being lost a little bit. Yeah. I tell you what, um, uh, I know I know the guys in the uh, department who are involved in policy making for SME and entrepreneurship, and uh, the next coffee in Dublin we have, I'll invite them because <laughs> you've got brilliant ideas, and I think it's important to share because you're coming from experience, and uh, coming from experience and having nothing, you know, nothing handed, and like mm -hmm. the reality is, we're going into entrepreneurship only now in the last couple of weeks. I think I've heard that if it doesn't work out, you could potentially claim the dole. Where somehow in Ireland we had this absolute messed up law yeah. which you went into business and if it didn't work out you don't get social welfare. I mean what is that about? That's only been remedied in the last yeah. few weeks as far as I'm aware. Yeah. So there's an awful lot more to be done, to, you know, an awful lot more to be done, an awful lot more, but it needs, um, again it's too easy to govern that, it needs a kind of a, this one size up fits all strategy has to change and mm. taxation is the easiest place to get in and do it. There's loads of places to get tax from. Yeah. They can't be applying the same to everybody in, in Limerick. And I walked through Limerick today and as I said, like there's parts of it that are thriving, there's parts of it that are under pressure. Like and also on this as well, foreign direct investment, as I said earlier, we're living with the scar of it here in Limerick. And that, you know, too much focus. It's been great for Ireland, but there's been too much focus and not enough on indigenous because if it's an Irish company then maybe they won't just decide we'll go to Poland because it's cheaper. Because every city in Ireland is sitting on a time bomb, which is Boston Scientific and Galway or Dell and Limerick, that if these companies decide to go elsewhere, not just them, but all the ancillary businesses, that it's a real unspoken about, yes, we want to have foreign direct investment, but you need to promote indigenous business at the exact same rate, or you're in trouble. Like, and it's, it's, we're seeing even with England now, with Brexit, businesses will pull out of there. So, um, yeah, I, I, not enough been done on, on Irish Irish. So we will, we can have that coffee, no problem. But I doubt I'll yeah. be listening to it because I don't think no, anyone listens. Do, there's, a, there's a good group in there now, I can vouch for that. We've had some of our bits on the, uh, in the policy now. So um, I think, uh, it, it, like, and every, a lot of people are saying the same kind of things, but I think a bit of pressure uh, on the government. And I mean, I think you've seen it. You can affect change if you're loud enough. And, um, you're certainly influential enough, I think, that and loud enough. it's important. <laughs> and loud enough. But no, I think you know, we, 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 we can we can all complain to each other, but it, we have opportunities as well to maybe get in front of the right people. So why not we're small enough, aren't we? Ireland well, that we can exactly yeah. We can kind of shout loud, you know. Well listen, thank you so much. It's been I was excited and uh, it was a great uh, conversation. I'm sure we could keep going uh, on and, and keep talking. So thank you very much and I suppose just to wrap up, like it's incredible, you know, 200 employees, you know, you're a global company now, award-winning uh, media company, in less than 10 years, look what you've achieved, and we're very proud in Limerick uh, to say that you were here for a little bit of your time, and that you say things like sound, which is great, and, um, and uh, that's, that's you know, Mayo, that was, uh, <laughs> and, and I think it's Manchester as well. And uh, I know Tachys, I think Tachys, Tachys is definitely in Limerick for runners. Yeah, and so do for some reason. Rapid. Rapid. Love that, yeah. love that. Um, no, we're very, very, very proud and wish you all of the success in the world. And uh, just love watching your journey. And we look forward to everything that's going to come in the future. Thanks, Steve. And if there's anything we can do to help, we'll be, we'll be right there with you. Cheers. So Thank, well you. Thank you. Thank you.